You can't study the history of the Catholic Church in the United States without coming across Isaac Hacker. He actually thought that the United States of America was a natural for Catholicism. It sounds funny to us today to think about, for a long time, many people asked whether it was possible to be Catholic and American. So where Hecker fits into this story, he was someone who thought about these issues long before and in a more intelligent way than a lot of people did. There's no doubt that this man is, in, is gifted with this religious genius. He's one of these God-intoxicated, God-obsessed souls. In 1822, America was not yet 50 years old. New York, the most important economic city in the country, was in the midst of constructing the Erie Canal to open the West. Because it was a port city, New York was vulnerable to the same epidemics as every other urban center. On the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a poor German family gathered around a three-year-old boy with smallpox. Things did not look good. The family walked into his room and told him that he was not going to make it, that he was going to go and be with God. Young Isaac Hecker responded, No, I shall not die now. God has great work for me to do, and I shall live to do it. He has two brothers who are older, John and George, and a mother. She was a devout Methodist, and that influenced Hecker. When Isaac Hecker was about four or five years old, his father deserted the family, and that created a, a financial crisis for them. The two older brothers dropped out of school and apprenticed as bakers, and their bakery business ultimately turned out to be quite successful. Isaac, when he was 10 or 11, worked for his brothers in the bakery. When he was in his early 20s, he had an experience that he couldn't explain. It, we would call it a spiritual experience. It was an experience of seeing the spiritual side of life. All of a sudden, he experienced what he understood as an angel standing at the foot of his bed. I saw a beautiful, angelic being and myself standing alongside of her, feeling a most heavenly, pure joy. It was quite different from dreaming. I have not yet attained the power to speak it. It rests in me yet undeveloped. Isaac Hecker himself, his religious journey really begins with a powerful interior experience of something. He doesn't know quite how to name it. This vision continually hovers over me, and its beauty prevents me from accepting anything else. After his vision, Isaac Hecker was struggling. He couldn't focus on his work at the bakery. He stopped eating. His concerned brothers did not know what to do, so they reached out to a minister and writer who would end up having an enormous impact on Isaac Hecker's life, Orestes Brownson. At that time, Brownson was, with Emerson, probably one of the two best-known intellectuals in the country. When he lived in Boston, he edited a thing called the Boston Quarterly Review, which he then changed to the Brownson Quarterly Review because he was writing it all. My dear friend, Mr. Brownson, it gave me a great deal of satisfaction to hear you had taken such an interest in my brother Isaac's afflictions. Mother thinks he's under a severe religious change, which she thinks all persons must have before they are Christians in a more or less degree. John Hecker. The brothers are just totally immersed in trying to get a business going and providing for the family. Brownson was the man who was older, respected, and who took a personal interest in him that did certainly provide some, for at least for a moment, for a time, uh, something of a kind of father function in his life. There is much in your present state to approve, also much which is dangerous. The danger is on the side of mysticism. The dreamy luxury of the whole spirit world is so captivating, and when frequently indulged, it acquires such a power over us 
that we cease to be free men. Orestes Brownson. And so Orestes Bronson had Isaac for a couple of weeks and then suggested to the brothers that he needed a, a context in which he could work out these issues, where there was a community of people who were asking the same kind of questions he was asking. Is the world more than it appears to be? Is there a deeper side to life? Is there something that we go through which opens our eyes to the ultimate questions of life? And that set him on a road of searching, of seeking, on September 12, 1836, over 1,500 people gathered to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Harvard University. During the festivities, some of the alumni snuck away and met at Willard's Hotel down the street. They were particularly frustrated with the state of American culture at the time. The purpose of the meeting, to create a prominent new discussion group of like-minded ministers, philosophers, and reformers. They would eventually become known as the Transcendentalist Club. Isaac Hecker arrived in Boston and began soaking in the wisdom and knowledge of these influential figures. Orestes Bronson was writing about the plight of the disadvantaged in society. Henry David Thoreau was exploring the spirituality that could be found in nature. Bronson Alcott sought to expand the current philosophies of education and social well-being. Leading the charge of the Transcendentalist was Ralph Waldo Emerson, whose writings on the importance of self-reliance would become a central aspect of the American character. Emerson is the person who really stands for that idea that America is beginning over again, that there's a whole new rebirth of humanity here in the, in the new world with its open space and its freedom from the rigid traditions of Europe. Encouraged by Orestes Bronson, Hecker soon made his way to Brook Farm. And Brook Farm is a transcendentalist commune. Hecker lives at it for a while, and it's basically a place to study. It's like a school. The residents took a liking to Isaac, responding immediately to his sincerity and curiosity. They eventually gave him the nickname Ernest the Seeker. I went walking in the woods and the scenery was beautiful. The green pine trees and the moss of various tints and the clouds with the sun bursting through them, the silence and shady mystery of the woods gave me such enchantment. Isaac Hecker. Hecker soon encountered another seeker with a similar love for nature, Henry David Thoreau. Isaac Hecker and Henry Thoreau were kindred spirits. Uh, you get that sense from Hecker's letter to Thoreau. They were both spiritual seekers. They were both pushing away from social conventions. They walked together. Thoreau valued anybody who would take a walk with him. And Hecker was a walker. Dear Henry, I have been stimulated to write you at this present moment on account of a certain project. It is to work our passage to Europe. The heaven shall be our vaulted roof, and the green earth shall be our bed. Let us see what the genius and stupidity of our honored forefathers have heaped up. Tis impossible, sir. Therefore, we do it. Friend Hecker, I am strongly tempted by your proposal, your method of traveling to live along the road, citizens of the world, without haste or petty plans. I have often proposed this to my dreams, and still do. The moment that Hecker issues the invitation, his response to it's very interesting. Thoreau does not quite want to say no. The idealism of it, the adventure of it appeals to him. But he was at exactly the moment when he was realizing that he needed that space to take this inner journey. That was the deciding point when uh, Thoreau determined somehow to go to Walden Pond. Still feeling lost and enticed by an invitation from Bronson Alcott, Isaac Hecker moved to another experimental community called Fruitlands. I have arrived at Bronson Alcott's new community, Fruitlands. 
there seems to be a much deeper life here. At Brook Farm, it was more outward. Here, it is inner. Well, Bronson Alcott is one of these guys in the Transcendentalist Club. It had the idea that you could start commune. It would have a new kind of economy and living structure. Uh, you try to form a utopian community apart and model how to live in a community, uh, you know, more productively, more creatively, in a more satisfying way with each other. Hecker is at Fruitlands for a short while. And uh, when he's there, interestingly enough, the catalog of the books that were in the library at Fruitlands was full of Catholic mystics. Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, Catherine of Genoa, and others. Transcendentalists like this mystical tradition of Catholicism. They just don't want all of the, the, you know, the stuff that goes with it. For Americans who had just gone through a revolution, uh, who were talking about liberty and freedom and human rights, the Catholic Church seemed like the antithesis of what their culture and what the revolution was about. Despite all the resources available at Fruitlands, Isaac Hecker would encounter a place where individuality ran amok. Brook Farm was organized chaos, whereas Fruitlands was just chaos. One youth, believing that language was of little consequence, startled newcomers with the most shocking profanity. A second irrepressible illustrated his theory by antics that would have sent him to a lunatic asylum, if he had not already been in one. The comment he made about it was there wasn't much fruit there because nobody did much work. The transcendentalist is one who has a keen sight, but little warmth of heart. He talks of self-reliance, but fears to trust himself to love. He would have written a critical essay on the power of the soul at the foot of the cross. After about day eight or 10, Bronson Alcott came to Isaac Hecker and he asked him what he thought of Fruitlands. And he wanted him to be completely honest. So Hecker was. He said that the women do all the work, the men do nothing. You don't know the first thing about farming and you're not growing anything. Given all these things, I've decided to leave. Without religion as the basis, guided by the Holy Spirit, it seems to me that there is no hope for these community movements. Isaac Ecker. After the meeting, Bronson Alcott commented to a friend, well, Hecker has flunked out. He's a coward. The friend responded to Alcott, no, you're mistaken. Hecker wanted more than we had to give him. In the spring of 1844, Isaac moved back to New York City, hoping to resume his old life. Mr. Brownson, my brother Isaac has arrived home and feels like taking hold of business again. But I think your Boston transcendentalists have had too much influence on his mind. The two older brothers' bakery business ultimately turned out to be quite successful. So they went from having very little money to ultimately owning a bakery to owning a flour mill, so they just got richer and richer as time went on. Two paths apparently lay before me. One road is to live in the world of business and make life as agreeable and happy as possible. The other road is to leave all behind and go into the unknown. The fact is I can do nothing while there is such a deep such a deep presence within me. Isaac Hecker. In the meantime, Arrestus Brownson continued to serve as a mentor to the youngest Hecker brother. I say frankly that I should rejoice to see you devoting yourself to the ministry. I believe it your vocation. I have believed it ever since I have known you. Isaac began to speak with many of the major religious leaders of the day. 
he visits the Mormons and the Unitarians. And he comes to think that there has to be something more that can unite the individual and the group better, and he becomes enamored with this idea of Catholicism. The Roman Catholic Church is the most despised in America and the least respectable, yet it is so rich and full. He found that there were all these other people, mystics, who had the same kind of life as he did, and that they had a home in the church, and so he sought to find his home in the church. So Hecker was a seeker, without question, as they were, but Hecker wanted some answer to the search. There was supposed to be some object at the end of the search. He went to a, a Catholic mass. He went to at least one, maybe more Catholic masses. At the same time, I'm sure there's an element of faith involved in all of this, which is ultimately he, he had that spark of insight. But he didn't trust himself, and so he wrote to Arrestus Bronson, only to have Arrestus Bronson say, I'm in the same place. My own feelings and convictions, in spite of my struggles to the contrary, carry me to the Catholic Church, and I foresee plainly that I must sooner or later become a member of it. There is no help for it. I know not whether this church be or not be what certain men call it, but this I know. It has the life my heart is thirsting for, and for which my spirit is in great need. On August 1st, 1844, Isaac Hecker was baptized at the original St. Patrick's Cathedral in Lower Manhattan. To pass from one Protestant sect to another is a small affair, and is little more than going from one apartment to another in the same house. But to pass from Protestantism to Catholicism is a very different thing. We break with the whole world in which we have hitherto lived. It is a commitment for life, for eternity. We enter it and leave no bridge over which we may return. Ralph Waldo Emerson was horrified to learn that Hecker had become a Roman Catholic. I mean, this was not only a desertion of all the, the things that Emerson was teaching Hecker, this was putting on chains and being mentally and spiritually enslaved. When I resolved to become a Catholic, Emerson invited me to tea with him, and he kept leading up to the subject and me leading away from it. He was fishing for my reasons with the plain purpose of dissuading me. He said, Mr. Hecker, I suppose it was the art, the architecture, and so on, which led you to her. No, said I, but what caused all that? Emerson doesn't believe that the church has any role in society. Hecker embraces this kind of grand vision of the perfectibility of society, but says, you know what's central to that? The church, the people of God. America's manifest destiny is not simply economic or political, it's spiritual. And one of the things it's supposed to do is to show how human freedom and religion can work together. All of this leads him to Catholicism. And at this point, you know, he, he sees a real big difference between himself and Emerson. Soon after his baptism, Isaac Hecker made the decision to become a priest and join the Redemptorist community. The main ministry of the Redemptorists in the 1840s focused on the vast number of immigrants coming to the United States. And so the Redemptorists were a congregation that was pretty typical of European missionary congregations, is that they wanted to encourage the traditions of the home country. Um, this led to perceptions that the U.S. Catholic Church was a foreign church. The Redemptors also sponsored mission bands, which were groups of priests who traveled the country in order to revive the faith of Catholics living throughout small town America. It was to this mission work that Isaac Hecker felt a special calling. Right after my ordination, my superiors employed me in the work of missions. This sacred ministry was a great source of consolation. 
that the parish mission was the Super Bowl of Catholic piety. Banners outside the church advertising this mission, maybe one week, maybe two weeks, begin with mass in the morning, then there'll be some instructions that morning. And then the great event of the mission was the evening sermon. The preachers were very, very dramatic. In small town America, the mission was often the only thing going on in town that week. Isaac Hecker was fascinated with the number of non-Catholics who came out to the mission. And so after the missions, they would often hold these non-Catholic lectures to try and encourage people to join the church. The prospects of our holy faith were never so encouraging in the United States as at the present moment. The American people are capable of great enthusiasm. It will produce the effects worthy of our faith and our spiritual mother, the Catholic Church. To be able to pull that off in the climate of, of Catholicism at that time was, I think, you know, rather unique and miraculous. There had been these riots in Philadelphia and Boston where there had been these, some of these know-nothings, these kind of militant nativists, anti-Catholic groups, had actually burned uh, a convent and destroyed a church. At one point, an anti-Catholic mob approached the original St. Patrick's Cathedral with torches. Archbishop John Hughes came in front of the cathedral and said, I have an army of 10,000 Irishmen. For every Catholic church that burns in the city of New York, two Protestant churches will burn. And the bullying stopped. You know, I never see Hecker complaining about the situation. His mindset was different. It was more positive, more future-oriented, more optimistic. There's always been a very uneasy, tense relationship between Catholics and American society. And more or less before people like Isaac Hecker, we presume that was the way it was going to be, always. Where he was the daredevil in this, is in the way that we're going to present it. America isn't anti-Catholic. America is right for the wisdom and the message and the invitation of Catholicism. The Catholic Church contains the ideal of democracy. And in the long run, the Church will be found necessary for democracy's preservation, as well for its continued advance towards perfect human brotherhood. Not satisfied with simply doing missions, he wrote his first book, Questions of the Soul. Hecker's book tried to address a larger audience about the compatibility of Catholicism and American culture. This establishes him as a recognizable and popular author in America in the 1850s. Questions of the Soul is one of the very few original and genuine American books our country can boast. Hecker presents the Catholic Church in its affirmative and positive character. He rests his arguments on that inward need which all men seek for truth and goodness. Orestes Brownson. The Redemptress in America had a new superior, Father Ruland. He did not believe that his Redemptress priest should be focusing on non-Catholics. So he scaled back on the missions to which Isaac felt a special calling. Ruland even began to suggest breaking up Hecker's mission group. Hecker was very unique in that regard, that he had this inner spirit within him that, you know, that he identified as a Holy Spirit that kind of drove him on and inspired his work. The ultimate trigger point for Father Rulin came when Hecker's group began talking about having an American English-speaking mission house. The American fathers are driven more by natural than by supernatural motives, and that is why I fear their plans are not free from the dangers of nationalism and a disregard for discipline. Father George Rulin. It was like this young, strong-willed, possibly passive-aggressive guy running up against German religious superiors. Fearing the end of the ministry to which they all felt a calling, the American priest gathered and chose Isaac Kerker to appeal to the Redemptor Superior in Rome. 
Hecker immediately began to collect letters of good standing from bishops across the country to gain support. If it be the will of divine providence that something should be done for the conversion of our fellow citizens in America, then we may hope for a positive outcome. Before departing New York, however, Isaac Hecker had failed in his efforts to obtain Father Ruland's permission to make the trip. Well, Isaac Hecker gets to Rome. Father Morin, the head of the, uh, the Redemptorist Order throughout the world, came and visited him his first day in Rome and said, I only have one question. Did you read my letter that told you not to come without permission? And Hecker said, well, yes, I did. And Morin said, that's enough. That's all I need to know. So a few days later, when uh, all the members of the General Council are present, Hecker walks in and Morin said, read the statement. Father Hecker gravely and formally violated the vow of obedience by undertaking a journey contrary to the express decree of the most reverent Father General. No other remedy for safeguarding authority can be found except the dismissal of Father Hecker. In regards to my own affairs, I cannot tell you how they stand. I am in the hands of God, and He alone knows where this will end. After a few days, Isaac made arrangements to stay in Rome so that he could fight his expulsion. But soon things would get even worse when reviews of his second book, Aspirations of Nature, were published. Father Hecker is not sound in his theology. What we call our Americanism does very well in the political world, but it cannot be transferred into the church without heresy and schism. Brownson's review of Aspirations of Nature came to Rome. People read it in Rome, and it was somewhat critical. Your article on my book, Aspirations of Nature, will increase the unfounded suspicions of Father Morvan and Father Ruland. Americans here are regarded as rebels. The United States has no status in Europe. Hecker spent the next few months looking for solutions. He prayed. He wrote. He haunted coffee shops. How often have I heard, why, Father Hecker, you are the happiest man in Rome. Little do they know how many sleepless nights have passed, how deeply I've suffered in these months. But I cling to the knowledge that if I follow the Spirit of God and place all my confidence in that Spirit, it will do for me what I dare not hope for myself. And this kind of Yankee ingenuity and Yankee determination and not knowing any better, he just said, no, I, I've, got to, I've got to find another, another way. And he finds Cardinal Bottom and Ball. A cardinal who knew how to listen and realized that Hecker was right. We needed to bring the gospel to the United States in the style of the United States, just as we bring the gospel to China in the style of China or to Australia in the style of Australia. Bottom the Wall is smart enough to say, to know that America is this up and coming power, and he's, he's got to be smart enough to be nice to, his, to this American. Cardinal Barnabo is very highly respected by the Pope, and Cardinal Barnabo wants to get Isaac in to see the Pope, and he was, he's convinced he'll charm the Pope. It didn't help that the Pope at the time was Pius IX. Pius IX was threatened by this liberal political movement going on throughout Europe, but especially in Italy. If Pius IX was a temporal power, all of central Italy are the papal states. The new Italian Democrats are advocating for revolution, and they get something under the reign of Pius IX. Democracy was something that threatened the church in very real ways and threatened them with a loss of power, a loss of territory. Cardinal Barnabo was finally able to get Hecker an audience with the Pope to discuss his ideas 
of forming a new religious community in democratic America. Holy Father, in the United States, our best informed citizens are becoming more and more convinced that the Catholic Church is necessary to enable our young country to realize her great destiny. American people are engrossed in worldly things and in the pursuit of wealth, and these are not favorable. The United States is in its youth, but the American people do not make money to hoard, nor are they miserly. Yes, they contribute generously to their churches. You see, I know the brights as well as the dark side of the Americans, but there is too much freedom in America. True, but that too has a good side. Many of these people, seeing in the United States that the church is self-sufficient and not necessarily connected with what they call despotism, will begin to regard her as a divine institution and return to her fold. Yes, the church is as much at home in a republic as in a monarchy or an autocracy. Then again, you have people and their opponents who get each other by the hair. There is also the Catholic truth, Holy Father, which, if once known, would act on these parties like oil on troubled waters. And allow me to add, Tres Saint Pierre, that it would be an enterprise worthy of your glorious pontificate to set on foot the measures necessary for the beginning of its conversion. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. Catholicism in Europe needs to be woken up. And so when Pius IX runs into Hecker, he sees this on fire, enthusiastic Catholic guy. And this comes across to Pius IX. He sees this, this aliveness, this, this spirit. On March 6, 1858, the word came. The American Redemptorist priests were to be dispensed from their vows and free to form another religious community, the first men's religious community founded in the United States, the Paulist Fathers. Hecker named the new community after the man most responsible for the initial spread of Christianity, St. Paul the Apostle. Just as St. Paul sought to proclaim the Christian message throughout the old world, the Paulist Fathers would spread the message of Catholicism throughout the new world. Our vocation is to welcome souls to the Catholic faith, to spread the faith through conferences, missions, lectures, sermons, the pen and the press. In 1858, construction had just begun on the Central Park of New York. The Archbishop of New York, John Hughes, established a new parish west of the park to address Manhattan's ever-growing Catholic population. To that parish, he assigned the new religious community led by Father Isaac Hecker, the Paulist Fathers. When Isaac comes back, he enters a period, almost a decade, of tremendously energetic activity. He's starting magazines, they're getting the, the religious order started, they build the parish. He's got a lot of visions and a lot of energetic work, the steam priest, he's called. If the civilization of our country is to play so important a part in the present and future of the world, our Paulist community has a work before it, not easy to exaggerate. Hecker is plugged into the idea that the United States has a saving mission in the world, and especially toward the church. He really believed that religious freedom and Republican government were providential. They, they didn't just happen. In need of money for the new Paulist community, and anxious to get his message out to a larger audience, Hecker made himself available as a national speaker on the Lyceum Lecture Circuit. The Lyceum Movement consisted of organizations that sponsored public programs throughout the United States. Speakers on the Lyceum Circuit included some of the biggest names of the 19th century. There were generals, abolitionists, Walt Whitman did that. Emerson was probably the most famous. 
Isaac Hecker, the Catholic priest, came to see me and desired to read lectures on the Catholic Church in Concord, I told him that nobody would come to hear him, nor could I possibly affect the smallest interest in anything that regarded his church. He's not in clerical garb. He's dressed like a layman. It's a completely secular setting. And, you know, those are the days that people would come out to listen to <laughs> lectures on theology. I mean, he did three nights in New Haven. By popular demand, the crowds just kept getting bigger. You say you have no time to pray. Have you time to breathe? Prayer is to the life of the soul as breathing is to the life of the body. Pray when you rise and dress. Pray when you are on your way to work or to your place of business. These short aspirations of the soul are like swift arrows which pierce the clouds and penetrate to the very throne of God. Isaac Hecker spoke American. He knew the American people and he translated, he did his best to translate the Catholic Church to that environment. The, the line he has at one time is that Christianity is never more impressive than when it's linked with freedom and intelligence. Upon returning to New York, Hecker created the first Catholic publishing house in the United States, the Paulist Press. The press started publishing a monthly magazine specifically made for American Catholics called The Catholic World. Among the many contributors to the Catholic world was Orestes Brownson. In time, what happened between Brownson and Hecker is that Hecker continued to be optimistic about the future of American Catholicism. Bronson began to sour on this issue. We are old-fashioned medieval Catholics in our habits and convictions. Father Hecker is more of a 19th century man than we are and believes more in the intelligence and good faith of the people than we do. There is an approaching conflict between the society of the 19th century and the Catholic Church. This requires a new awakening of the spirit of Christianity. On June 29, 1868, Pius IX summoned an ecumenical council with the papal bull Eterni Patris. The first Vatican Council, as it became known, was commissioned to directly address the rising influence of modernity and the church's response towards it. So Hecker gets involved in that, of course. Because he's so popular with the American bishops, he's able to go to Rome as a theological advisor. He was nervous about the spirit of the council, the internal politics of the church, and the kind of clash of egos, if you will, uh, that he saw in Rome. Many of the transactions of the council are nothing more than a big caucus meeting. Rome is a crucible in which one's faith either becomes wholly supernatural or disappears entirely. And he gets very involved in big battle at the end about whether or not they actually should declare this doctrine of papal infallibility. The Pope had suffered a lot of loss. After 1848, the Papal States were basically the walled city of Rome. They were no longer the central Italy. Pius IX wants to strengthen his position. He wants to declare that the Pope is infallible. Not just the Church is infallible, but the Pope is infallible. And that was a hard pill to swallow for many, many people. I think what it says is this. You guys are taking over our temporal power. We're keeping our spiritual power. And that was a very different direction than than Hecker saw, thought the church should be moving. Uh, he called this a preoccupation with externals, by which he meant kind of the authority and the offices and the structures. He just thought that, wow, you know, if, if the Europeans would just figure out that they need to separate the church from the state, then the church would just flourish. The papal infallibility for the American bishops is that they're living in a Protestant country which already thinks they're un-American. And this sounds like a king, sounds like an emperor. There is a question about some elements of infallibility, about what is infallible and what is not. The Pope can only do this in certain areas. He doesn't do this in everything that he says, but rather in the issue of faith and morals. What happened at Vatican I put Hecker into a very difficult spot, and it caused great turmoil in his soul. 
On July 18, 1870, the First Vatican Council approved the doctrine of papal infallibility. Two months later, the Pope's worst fears were confirmed. Forces supporting democracy in Italy took over the Papal States and invaded Rome, forcing Pius IX to flee to St. Peter's Basilica. It would be another 50 years before any man who assumed the chair of St. Peter would leave the grounds of the Vatican. After returning to America, Isaac Hecker began to struggle physically, mentally, and spiritually. Disappointment with the outcome of the First Vatican Council, physical ailments, and a sense that God had abandoned him all hit him at once. All of the sufferings of my past life appear as nothing compared with those that God has laid upon me at this juncture. At Vatican I, I think he had a crisis where he thought that the impulses in his soul were leading toward greater democratization in the church and in society. And Vatican I went back in the other direction. Isaac's energy began to drop dramatically. A blood disorder was diagnosed, and doctors encouraged him to travel and seek different surroundings. The idea that founders sometimes separate from their communities or they feel that their community does not understand what they're attempting to do, I think that's very, very real. I think that's part of many religious communities. It is a part of the Paulist Fathers. During the years of the formation of the Paulists, all my companions were more and more inclined to increase the discipline, fixed rules, and external authority than I was. When he takes a trip up the Nile with people, you really do have a sense of his almost mystical transformation of his understanding of God's spirit at work in the great panoply of human history outside of the normal categories of the Western world. One of the things that amazed Hecker was that, that religion was so intimately woven into the, the, their daily life and their daily activities. And the fact that they prayed several times a day really impressed Hecker. Allah. These Arabs, whom we have learned to despise, pray at all times and in whatever they do. Their interior recollection is that of a saint. These Muslims have a gift of vocal prayer. It's all moving in this progressive direction toward a great synthesis. What he always wanted was this synthesis between the individual and the group, between his longings and his intellectual life. And he thinks that the whole age is now moving in that direction. And that every culture, every people has their providential calling not just the Americans. His friends call him back to, you've got this community of brothers who, who care for you and who love you, and you should be back here with us, sharing in the work, and if you have problems, you should be here with us. Although his physical symptoms continued, Hecker's trip had helped address some of his struggles. Isaac Hecker had initially opposed infallibility, but when the doctrine came, he accepted it fully. And Isaac Hecker basically said, look, another f fundamental part of our Catholic belief is, is fallen into place. We're now free to not worry about that, but to get about the business of evangelizing the world. Hecker came back to America to resume his ministry and threw his energies into the construction of St. Paul the Apostle Church in New York City. Hecker builds this fabulous church. It says he's this, I'm going to make it up a temple of beauty. So he gets the best architects, 
the, the most famous people he can find to show people the majesty, the spiritual treasure of Catholicism. Yet his illness and his dark night continued. He would stare out the window, he would um, be very quiet. Uh, the doctor couldn't seem to do much for him. He spent his life trying to figure out what the Holy Spirit wanted him to do. At the end of his life, he had to accept that he couldn't do what he thought he was supposed to do, and this was very painful for him. That's heroic. I think that's heroic holiness. On December 22, 1888, at the rectory of St. Paul the Apostle in New York City, and surrounded by his Paulist brothers, Isaac Hecker died. Hecker gets whacked after his death, so he's a victim of the controversy between liberals and conservatives, and his name becomes smudged. After Hecker's death, the Paulus had written a biography to continue his legacy. But when a French translation of the book ended up oversimplifying Hecker's ideas, critics within the church, sensitive to the revolutions of the past century, began to speak up. Herr Hecker et il ensemble. That was the title of a book that set off a crisis in American Catholicism called Americanism. It is known to you, beloved son, that the biography of Isaac Thomas Hecker has excited not a little controversy on account of certain opinions brought forward concerning the way of leading Christian life. We are not able to give approval to those views which are called by some Americanism. Pope Leo XIII. I don't think the bishops in the United States even knew this was going on, that there was something now called Americanism. So Cardinal Gibbons opens a letter from Leo XIII to find out there is actually something called Americanism that has just been condemned in Rome that he had never heard of, all right, that was very much associated with Isaac Hecker. Isaac Hecker was an extraordinarily loyal, orthodox, conservative Catholic priest when it came to doctrine and faith and morals. Absolutely no questioning. He converted to Catholicism. He found the teaching of the faith so compelling. As the 20th century unfolded and the world plunged into war, the Catholic Church began to reevaluate its relationship with democracy and started re-engaging with the perspectives Isaac Hecker had championed. Vatican II validated the Catholic experience in the United States, and by extension, Isaac Hecker. I'm especially, of course, delighted to have a part in the opening of the cause for the beatification and ultimately the canonization of Father Isaac Hecker. A great New Yorker, I like to say, the man who was the first pastor of this parish and the inspiration of all the wonder of the community of St. Paul. I'm hopeful that Isaac Hecker will be a Canada saint because I think Isaac Hecker has a lot to teach us. To teach us about hope, to teach us about optimism, to teach us about dialoguing with culture and being modern Christians. His journey is the journey that other Americans can and should take uh, to answer their deepest questions and their most important yearnings. We canonize people not for them, we canonize them for us. And I think in lifting him up as a holy hero, what we're doing is providing opportunities for U.S. Catholics to think about what it has meant to be a Catholic in this country, what it means today to be a Catholic in this country. So in a sense, he's all American Catholics patron saint.